So as um, the title says, of course, unusual sites in Minnesota lakes, sometimes those sites won't be readily apparent why they're unusual or weird, uh, but they're weird to us, yeah. and we'll tell you why. Um, <laughs> okay. First of all, this is MHM. Chris and I are underwater archaeologists, and we have a small group of volunteers that dive with us, and a small group of uh, other volunteers like Betty, who actually lives in Ohio, who does some work for us as proofreading, and Anne Hoig, uh, she serves sometimes as a dive crew for her husband, uh, Kelly, and our very small uh, board of trustees. It's only three people. And of course, our mascots, Freddie Mercury and Roddy, Mc Roddy McKay, who may eventually show up behind us at some point. So our cats are... We basically, it's their house. We just pay the mortgage, yeah, right. yeah. you know, so cat. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> cats. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is uh, basically how we do a, a typical survey uh, with our sonar. We uh, uh, go to a lake, do the uh, edge, the shore, we survey along the shoreline first, and then uh, do what's called mowing the lawn, where we do transects that are, uh, initially they're 250 feet apart, but then we uh, shortened it recently to about 100 feet apart. Depending on what we're yeah, it depends on depth the and depth location yeah. and all that, and just uh, go back and forth right. and uh, and it can be east, west, north, or south, depending on wind. Yeah, more sometimes dynamic. we like to try to head into the wind as much as possible. Yeah, and with the wind, um, after we do the initial mowing the lawn, we often go back and then do targeted sonar surveys for certain anomalies that we find for one reason or another, whether we think it's a wreck or something we want to look at again. So if I put all of our tracks up, because you can put our tracks in Google Earth, it's a mess. It's just a squishy, squishy mess. And I have to color code the different years because we've been on Lake Minnetonka so many times that, yeah, it gets a mess. And uh, that's our research boat, um, Anomaly 51. Uh, we initially started our surveys using a 12-foot Alumacraft. And uh, that got a little dicey at times in high winds. <laughs> and that boat belonged to our chair of our board. He loaned it to us. So, But this boat actually belongs to MHM, donated by my mom. She hey. paid for it. Um, here's the lakes we're going to talk about, at least the, the weird stuff we found in these lakes, Lake Minnetonka and Lower and Upper Prior Lake, Lake Pulaski. I learned to swim there. I, I grew up in Wright County. Lake Johanna and Medicine Lake. And that would be it. Here's the first thing. We found a cauldron with beer in it on the bottom of Lake Pulaski. Um, Somebody was partying, I guess. <laughs> well, and probably the winter. winter. Yeah, this had to be on the ice and it has burnt, it has charred wood in it. So they had a fire. But why they had beer bottles in with the burned wood, I don't know. But you'll see there's two bottles of beer. There's a Corona and a Bud Light. And I, yeah, the, the sonar picture is really cool. It's this big round thing. I didn't know what we didn't know what to expect really. Well, but maybe, maybe a sewer out, out yeah, output or something. A sewer, like. but that's it's a big round cauldron. Um, metal, dunk, dunk, dunk. It's made out of metal. I, we don't get it, but it's kind of cool. It's got cold beer. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. You you explain, old man. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, in uh, Crater Lake, uh, there's a uh, in log, Oregon. In Oregon, yeah. there's a there's a log that's been floating since the late 1890s. It's still there, it's called Old Man of Crater Lake. And it just bobs. Just yeah. bobs around Crater Lake. Uh, we found something somewhat similar in uh, St. Albans Bay in Lake Minnetonka, which you see in the uh, upper left corner there, uh, Anomaly A70. It's a, uh, maybe, maybe- A piling, a, yeah, or a telephone Yeah, or a telephone pole. pole. Yeah. That's just uh, resting on the bottom. I could actually lift it up. Yeah, it's not embedded. It's, it, but it's not floating on the surface either. It's just uh, sitting there uh, loose on the lake bottom. And um, apparently doesn't go very far because there's no current or anything. And uh, we just sonared it this spring, yeah. and there it is. There's the shadow, uh, the and one on top. That that's from the spring. They're basically so. in the same location. And not even this spring, actually, it was last month. We sonared that last month. So, and like the old man, we also get stumps. People are lazy and don't want to stick the stump on a truck and drive it somewhere or burn it or whatever. So they actually dump them. They put them on the ice. Obviously, they drag them out on the ice and they sink. And in Stubbs Bay. There's a, there's a forest of stubs, and, and they make good fishing spots. That's a, A76, by the way, Yeah. and, and the two to the right of that one. Yeah, and 563 is in Wyzetta Bay, and it's just, it, it looks so cool. I, I thought it was a boat. It was a massive stump. Oh, yeah, and it looked like a boat. We're like, oh, great, a wreck, and it's not. It's but A225, uh, that actually stood about seven, eight feet off the bottom. It's in it's 50 feet of water. It's root ball. Yeah. So. I mean, you get the video. You see, the, there is a, a diver next to that stump. It's huge. It was a big, big, big tree sitting on the bottom. Then on the lower right, we, uh, we occasionally find uh, bogs. 
that uh, broke off from land. Uh, Swamps. Or, yeah, yeah, broke off from a swamp, drifted out, and then just sank. And they were in the late early 90s, there was a big problem with bogs on Lake Minnetonka. Um, and all these are Lake Minnetonka, obviously. But um, the bogs were getting so big, they would float around at night. And people were hitting them with their boats. Tonka Bay had a big problem with it. Uh, the, the mayor actually had to call the you know, sheriff and say, what to do and why aren't we, where, you know, what's going on? Um, but um, they have cattails still on them, the, the little fuzzy things. And we just found another bog in Crystal Bay this year using an ROV actually. There's one in Smith Bay we have not, or no, excuse me, Browns Bay, we haven't dove on. And then this one, anomaly number one, we expected this wreck and yeah. it was a bog. First <laughs> so. thing we dove on ever in Lake Minnetonka. And it's a bog. Okay. Um, then we have a submerged water ski course in Prior Lake. We call it the Brooklyn Bridge too. Yeah. I mean, you see the thing? Just It's sitting on poles. Whoever like, built this, uh, put a lot of effort into it because no. it's basically this these series of buoys that is attached to a framework that's anchored but it's anchored in such a way that uh, uh, if you add air to these bladders that are at the uh, base of the uh, of the frame uh, the whole thing will raise to the surface and you got your uh, little water ski course and, and, when, and when you're done with that uh, you let the air out and the whole thing sinks back down I mean, and it hasn't been used for a long time. Yeah. I mean, the thing was probably only built, what, 15, 20 years ago or something. But it, it actually, it has hoses. It actually has quick release hoses for like scuba gear. You could bring a, like our scuba tank, you could hook it to it and it would raise up. And we found one of these in up, uh, Lower Prior Lake, that's this one, and it's 800 feet long. I mean, this thing goes on and on and on and on. There's a 600 foot long one, or 680 feet, I believe, in South, uh, or upper prior lake, excuse me, it's the southern part of the lake. That one we, we kind of sort of dove on a little bit, but it, the visibility is really bad in that area, but it has it has a really interesting sonar signature. This one has flopped down on the on the bottom. It's not standing up like this one. So, and we think, I think we have other ones in other lakes too. I think Lake Minnetonka's got one or two and maybe Lake Johanna. It's kind of, until we dive on those, though, it's hard to tell because it could be power lines. There's power lines and phone lines on the bottoms of the lakes. All the but, uh, kudos to whoever built this. This was uh, quite, Complicated. An <laughs> quite an extensive uh, rig they had going. And it looks like the, when we first went over it, I was like, holy, what the hell is this? Um, so anyway, Brooklyn Bridge. It's very odd. Okay, a sunken hockey rink. Now that can't be that surprising because it's Minnesota. Uh, but usually people get their plastic off the lake before they sink. Not this time. Uh, you can see there's a goalie, a goal, and we've got it. We did it several different ways on our sonar. We on it, we haven't dove this yet. Um, we're, so we're calling it the second hockey rink and goal. If but we are wrong, we'll admit it later. But a local uh, informant told us that, that, you know, when we asked him about this, he just pointed to the exact same spot and said, they always have yeah, a rink there. there. Yeah, if you look at old Google Earth photos uh, from years back, you do, we do see a cleaned off section of the, of the lake in this area. So they let their plastic sink. What that's doing to the environment or the poor fish, we would have to go down and look because um, it's a tarp. Well, if it's plastic or if it's a tarp, which is, you know, fabric, it might not be so bad. A third person shows. Oh, we do? Oh, okay, okay. just one second. Yeah. Okay, I can't see the, whoever just short joined us. Hello, I'm, our um, mouse has a little problem. If it's Steve Workman, hello. Uh, so we're working on what sunken hockey goal uh, and rink. In, in Lake Johanna, that little lake has some weird stuff. Um, so that would that can be raised or not raised depending on what the DNR would say, because this isn't artifactual yet. So. A railroad crossing pole yeah, in Prior Lake. This was in a, the uh, little passageway between Upper and Lower Prior Lake. And uh, it's right next to an old railway embankment. And uh, the shape of it, you can almost see, it's like one of those uh, traditional uh, signal lights with a ladder that goes on one side. Mm -hmm. So and it, oh, another person. Okay, hello, another person. Uh, I would switch, I could let you talk, but it won't let me, so we'll just keep going here. Uh, it's just the way it works out. So we had railroad crossing pole, is kind of odd, and a big dock. Now, that's not a weird thing. It's not, an, except for how big it is and where it is in Prior Lake. It's in about eight feet of water, probably built for when, in the 1930s, when the uh, water was really low with the drought. Um, otherwise, there's no, or, this looks like this could have reached from the island where it near is near to, to the land. So I bet you it was when the water was really low, but it's really big. Except here's a bigger one. In little tiny Lake Johanna, 
little, yeah. Jake, Lake Johanna is a tiny little lake. This is almost more like a boardwalk, really. It's huge. It's, 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 yeah. It was probably built during the 1930s when they had some severe droughts in the yeah. area. And it's just basically lying on top of the uh, bottom of the lake there. And it probably was there to begin with. It probably hadn't been on, on stilts. We don't know. It, it, I'm, I'm surmising that it was up yeah. actually not on, not on pilings, but on the bottom of the lake. And that's the lake was that shot. It just had to, to get out to the water. They'd use that to walk, but, yeah. or it could have been on stilts, but it, it, once the water rose again, whoop, and this is, you know, this is 90 feet long, 100 feet long and mm -hmm. just huge for this itty bitty lake. And there's some metal pieces sitting on top of it. We're not, don't know why I, yeah. in a really big section. So water intakes in Lake Minnetonka. Yeah. Weird. Look at the sonar signature. Very odd. Uh, sonar, the acoustical signature shows, shows the top bit but it's got screens on it for, for sieving. Obviously it's full of zebra mussels and it's not in use anymore. Um, this thing, yeah. the pipes go right from this. It's, you follow the pipe, which we did find. And it, aim, yeah. it aims for the uh, Minnetonka Beach Water Tower. Yep. So. so Minnetonka Beach Water Tower took water from the lake in Crystal Bay and took it through the intake. Now the other one is in Gideon Bay and it's much smaller, much simpler, and it's near where they had a railroad stop on the railroad track. So we think it's probably water for the, for the steam trains, probably. Um, it could be for people too, but there's, they're not being used, but there's just maritime infrastructure on the bottom of the lake that you don't expect to find. That crib is really cool. I mean, look, it's just in, still in one neat piece and just sitting there. It's fantastic. The doorless refrigerator. Yeah. Someone just throws their garbage in Lake, in lake Pulaski. Um, At least they took the door off so the kids will get caught. <laughs> yeah, the kids won't get caught inside. Um, or baby fish, I don't know. <laughs> baby fish won't get caught. Um, it's just, it's one of those things you find on the bottom, like just like the hot water heater. Um, initially, that looked like a nice little wreck. Um, you can see the sonar is kind of bland. That's old sonar from like 2011. And it's just full of zebra mussels. So basically, it's a fishing spot too. These kinds of things, you know, attract fish. The big serpent, <laughs> the newspaper report about the serpent of Lake Minnetonka. So someone found that they thought it was a sea serpent or big snake. It was several hundred feet. I mean, what, 1500 feet or something like that of, of fire hose that got somehow dumped into the water or led into the water. And we haven't found it yet. We don't know if they pulled it out. But of course, cartoonists, you know, back then just loved it. You know, here's the super, super serpent of the, of the lake. And on the sonar there, you see two, two lines going into, um, or two, well, they could be cables, they can be phone lines, uh, the conduits of some sort, or they could be part of the serpent. We're not sure. We haven't dove on them, but around the lake, you get tons of phone lines. Like on the bottom left, that's a phone line. Um, in the 1950s, they rolled a phone, phone line across the ice between Excelsior and Wyzetta, the north and the south, and rolled it across, there's pictures of it. And you can see when you've got a hill, it, it spans the hill and it's and sticking up in the water column, which I'm sure has got some, some anchors attached to it probably. Mm -hmm. So we do have lots of different things like that. Um, and you can follow them around the lake, you know, with our sonar. So, and the railroad cart is the railroad yes, cart. Generic railroad cart. And it's by a depot. So Actually, there you go. Actually, it was by the uh, section foreman's house, too, in Wyoming. Yeah, there. that's true. Yeah. And it, the, the old depot, the Great Northern Depot, where James J. Hill brought his, his locomotives into. So probably a late luggage cart or something for, for the, we don't know. So, and now, of course, there's snowmobiles. It should be expected. Um, but to find some nice, polar, uh, you know, nice Polaris, you know, we've got um, one we don't know what kind it is because you can't tell because the visibility is horrendous. Um, that's a Polaris, and that is, I'd never heard of a Rupp. Yeah, Rupp. Rupp, a Rupp uh, snow, snowmobile. So, of course, people are going across the ice. It's thin, and they're, they go in. It happens. I mean, it's Minnesota. Boat lifts and canopies. Now, of course, you'd expect to find some boat lifts in the water, but not this many from big winds. This, is just, this isn't even all of them. This is just a select few. I mean, Lake Minnetonka's got about 10. Prior Lake's got almost 10, at least 10. Yeah. Madison Lake has one, White Bear Lake has one, and these are all the only ones that we've um, actually, you know, identified. So they yeah. blow off a dock. Yeah, and... that one sonar picture uh, on the left, second from the left, we mm -hmm. called it the chair. 
It's a chair. Uh, we, and we thought maybe it could have been a, a lifeguard platform that got blown out there. But, uh, and sadly, it was a boat lift. Yeah. So. And they've got their wheels on them. Some, you know, they're, they're automatic yeah. crank and some don't have, aren't automatic crank and canopies, got lots of canopies. Uh, that's, a, that's a canopy, not yeah. an actual boat lift. So stuff that flies into the water. And we've got several more canopies that we show here too. This is weird. <laughs> Plywood with rope and concrete blocks. Now, fishing spot? That's about the best thing we can figure. Is that somebody yeah. wanted to make their little artificial reef and uh, just made it really simple. I had uh, some concrete blocks yeah. and a piece of plywood and some rope and uh, set it down. And there it goes. And probably and, on the ice and then put it through. Yeah. yeah. It has, as far as I can tell, it hasn't really worked because there weren't any fish around it. But it's weird. Plywood with ropes on it. Okay, sure. Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Weird. Rubble piles. Again, lazy people. When people want to get rid of stuff. They'll drag it out on the ice. And there's two, those are two different piles. We we figured it wasn't going to be a wreck when we looked at it because obviously it looks like two piles. But the rubble, it's brick. It's a complete bunch of rubble, brick rubble. And these are only two of the, the rubble yeah, we piles found, we find. We have several more. Yeah. We found one near uh, Big Island <laughs> where uh, that consisted of the special type of terracotta bricks that the amusement park had that was in, running on that island between 1906 and 1912. Yeah, and that brick rubble pile is actually now part of the site. We, 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 we made that into an, an underwater or underwater and terrestrial uh, archaeological site through the state, and that pile is part of that site, even though it's off, off the island. We did some work out there for the city of Orono, our report's out there if you want to know. We did some terrestrial work for that last year. So these are just another group of fishing spots that people make. Uh, pile, pi piles of tires. Now we haven't dove those yet because they've been a low priority, but I'm pretty sure they're tires from the looks of them. With other things mixed in, who knows. Then they had a bunch of uh, stumps that were attached to uh, chunks of concrete, just to create, again, make artificial reefs. Make structure, yeah, yeah. for fish. Then uh, they had a number of pallets that were uh, uh, tied together. And, uh, There's 12 of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's a huge. And uh, actually, those seem to be a little more effective, I think. They actually sell fish around those. And they look like little Borg cubes to me. The nerd in me says so Borg cubes. DNR does not like people doing this sort of thing. Because we contact, we have contacts at the DNR, of course, and I did uh, email them and said, you know, are you guys okay with this or did you sanction this? And they said, oh, heck no. <laughs> we did not give people permission to do this. But if you don't catch them, and they do it. I mean, we can certainly, the DNR, if they want to raise these and get it, they won't, it's a, it's a bother. It costs too much money. They'll leave them where they are. But they're huge collectors of zebra mussels. But they also collect fish. So people can, can, uh, can do that. Three of the coolest rubble piles we've ever found. The remains of the Lafayette Club and the Lafayette Hotel. The Lafayette Hotel burned down in the 1890s. And then the first Lafayette Club burned down in the 1920s. The Lafayette Club that there's right now is a rather boring white building. But the two buildings, we can't tell if this stuff is from the both buildings or just one or the other. So we we're just calling it uh, bubble piles for the two buildings. Really neat. I mean, that way, that wagon wheel, so cool. But that's a bedpan, we think. Um, it's got chamber, a chamber pot. <laughs> chamber pot yeah. for bedpan. It's got workings of inner duct work. It's got a boiler. There's, yeah, there's, there's like a metal cabinet. It's almost like uh, lockers, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's got all this different stuff in three different piles, distinct piles too. So that says out under the ice, spring comes, boom, it, they sink it down. It's the easiest way to do it. Of course, there's going to be cars. Everybody knows that. But the number of old cars that we have was, yeah. it has been surprising. We were kind yeah. of surprised. We couldn't for the longest time figure out what um, the, the Model A frame, uh, what that was initially until they stumbled across a picture on the uh, internet. Yeah, that, that little insert that, there. That showed the uh, wooden framework, and I, I've seen that. Yeah, it's on the bottom of the lake. So that is a Model A coupe. Um, the overturned 19, I wish we could see that these do, they do tend to flip, which is kind of a bummer. They land upside down a lot. They do. Um, and so you can see the, the, the Plymouth is pretty cool, though, because you can pretty much see everything of the Plymouth. And then the T, the Model T body, again, part of a part of a car. So people back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, whenever they wanted to get rid of these derelicts, it was easier to drag them on the ice and let them sink. Although sometimes they do have dunk the clunk. And that's what this 1955 Mercury Monterey is, we think. And maybe the maybe the Chevy too. Yeah. We're not sure. But they did a, a contest um, where they for the raising money for the um, 
what's the group? Knights of Columbus? Yeah, Knights of yeah. Columbus would, they'd have a, a drawing, a, a $1 per draw, and you say, what time is the clunk going to sink? And they tie a rope to the clunk so they could pull the clunk out of the water. Yeah, during winter. Like. Right, of course. It's going to be on the, on the ice. But when the first day of ice, out, so, who, who gets, when they, they win the pot of money. Um, but they didn't bring one up, <laughs> or maybe yeah. two. They might have missed a couple of them, or the rope broke or something. But yeah. And the Capri Classic, uh, that, yeah. that's a little bit strange to us. Yeah, it's in deeper water. Deeper water. Offshore. Uh, not yeah. close to shore, very, not very close to shore. And uh, I mean, we had our contact and the DNR run the plates and said so there's, you know, nothing un unusual. Un unusual about it. Actually, so. the plates were assigned to a van in Maple Grove, so it's yeah. driving around somewhere. But what this one says to us is that someone was had a fish house out there, really far out though, surprisingly far. And oops, they their car went down. I mean, it, the windows weren't open though. You normally drive on the ice with windows open. Um, there's something in the car. It looks like a hoodie. We don't. I, we don't know if there's a dead person in there. It's up to the sheriff to figure that out. We told them about it, yeah. and they haven't looked at it yeah. yet. But at some point, they said they're going to try to use it as a as a training dive for search and rescue. And they yeah, might, might try to bring it up. And, and that's up to them, or just break the windows and get in to yeah. see and save the person that's not really in there. That's up to them. It's not archaeological. It's out of our hands. Um, but the um, Dodge Ram. Oops, <laughs> that was a thirty five thousand dollar mistake, or something. Um, yeah landed on the bottom and it went poof i mean it's buried up almost past the doors it's it's so heavy just and that's in 60 feet of water it just went poof um we don't more don't know much about it we'd have to clear away the silt to see the license plate and maybe someday we, we would do that but you know that it's a low priority for us well yeah the vertical <laughs> the vertical yeah uh, off the bottom finding in cars it's kind of unusual when they land vertically uh, this Chevy Nova is buried um, a little bit past its uh, the driver's door, but standing. You know, you see said, the, the side, the yeah, down image there, and from the sonar. Yeah. Standing vertically, uh, pretty rusty. Um, nice uh, hubcap. Yeah, don't couldn't really find any uh, license plates for it, so we don't know much about it. And the visibility in Medicine Lake can sometimes be pretty iffy, so the visibility is not great uh, the day we dove. Plus, it's dark. It's dark. It's dark. Water, even though it's 30 feet, the water can't get through the the uh, stuff in the water column sometimes. But, but it's for Medicine Lake again, another one vertical. Yeah. So these are side images of the vertical. Like we couldn't get a decent down image, but sticking in, standing straight up again, just yeah, like the one past the uh, driver's doors and uh, this front one we, doors. We did get a nice picture of the uh, yeah of the license plate. And what amazed me was okay the the. Uh, the modern picture we got was from an auction site that uh, was selling a 63 Rambler. And uh, they had taken pictures of practically every angle and they included a picture of a, of a plate that uh, touted the uh, rust proof primer <laughs> paint that was on that car. Yeah. And uh, I hope they kept the formula because that car just had surface rust. There was no rust and no part of the body was rusted through, and un un unlike what the Chevy Nova. Yeah, and it was has. bright blue like that. If you, you it's just you know clean out the squidge a little bit, you got some bright blue paint. Yeah. Really neat. But I like the the Rambler hubcap is just just classic. The big R. That's just so cool. <laughs> okay, the, there's a big long story behind this. Now the wet bike, you wouldn't be surprised, I guess, to find one. It's the precursor to the Wave Runners and. Arctic Cat made some sort of wave runner things literally in the early, you know, in the 70s. But we find hysterical is that James Bond in The Spy Who Loved Me walks, I, I, I got the, the movie from the library, walks into the room, puts down a duffel bag and builds himself a wet bike. Now, supposedly the, the motor's in there. This thing's several hundred pounds with the motor <laughs> and the skids. But he, he walks in and puts it down. And I, I thought it was so funny. He's not carrying that unassisted, no <laughs> way. So, and I think he might've come out from an underwater lair even, Woo! like this thing, like you could like, where's your scuba gear? I, anyway, so it's just pretty funny. We found a wet bike. Obviously it wasn't buoyant or something and it sank. Um, it wasn't that popular. It, it was chips used it you know tv shows love this thing because it, it plays academy three because it was really new then but now of course we've got wave runners that look just like snowmobiles they they went with that design this is the kind that would raise go up and down and take off and then and come down at hydraulics it's weird but it's on the bottom of the lake of lake Mendoza. um this is a nice rack it doesn't look that weird except boats in miami miami oklahoma 
Now, we don't know, we didn't know what kind of boat this was until Chris was cleaning off the transom and found the, um, the builder's plate and the over, uh, outboard motorboat club plates. Now, we don't take things off wrecks, we're not looters, but they came off in his hand. So he did bring them up. I conserved them, cleaned them up, got the information off of them, and then we put them in a waterproof bag and went back to the wreck and attached it back to the wreck, to the, to the marine plywood deck. So they're, they're down on the wreck with an explanation of what happened, you know, who we are, waterproof bag so people can read it in the future so everyone knows what happened. But that's the only reason we knew it was a Blue Star because yeah. he found that Blue Star Miamian. I mean, um, the picture there is not a Blue Star. I think that's a Lone Star. It's not a Blue Star. So we can't find a picture of this boat anywhere. Yeah. If anyone can find one. That's kind of an example of, you know, just because something may have sunk recently doesn't mean it's well documented. I mean, recently meaning 60s, yeah. yeah or, you know, within the last 50, 60 years. Because this is a tornado casualty, we think. The 60, if you don't know, the 65, 1965, the week he was born uh, had 200 tornadoes in, in Minnesota. Four of them hit Lake Minnetonka and destroyed several cities um, and just swaths of houses and several and the boats were flown all over the place. There's pictures yeah, and this we, was we one think of them. This was probably tied up to a dock because the boat, the motor's in the stow position. The interior is pretty much has everything blown out of it. The windshield's gone and the steering wheel is all battered. So we think it was probably tied to a dock, got blown out in the lake and sank. Yeah, and the seats are gone. The seats aren't anywhere nearby either. So they got really blown out. So. And a doodle bug. Yeah, this was never knew what a doodle bug was until I found until I found <laughs> this. Uh, yeah, it, basically it's a Model T that's been uh, stripped down and used as kind of a farm tractor almost. Uh, this one had uh, its uh, rear axle replaced with the uh, with a truck axle with dual rear tires. Uh, one of the tires has been uh, taken off, so I wonder if it may have been used as a uh, sort of a power source for something like a, a sawmill or a, maybe even in this case an ice cutter. Maybe this was uh, cutting uh, ice blocks out in the lake at some point. From its location, that makes the most sense. It was yeah. off, of a, off of one of the islands in Upper Lake. Um, and it's, it's got an electric starter, which uh, I think it was uh, 1919 that yeah. Model T's first had starters motors introduced. So it's a 1920s vehicle that was modified probably into the 40s, you know, that it was still still being used. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was unexpected. <laughs> really just gorgeous wheels. And the you see the Ford hub, and there's a new Ford hub. I did we just include that picture for comparison. That's what it would look like if we could get if it was new. So and the Lund fishing boat wreck. Isn't that special? It's a fishing boat, uh, except it was stolen. It's special to us when we can find the backstories yeah. to some of these wrecks. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, this one, uh, when we found it, uh, noticed something was up in that the uh, flotation seats were taken off and cinder blocks put in its place. So uh, that was an indication this was deliberately scuttled. Plus, you know, whenever you find a boat that doesn't have its motor attached, uh, it was probably deliberately scuttled. Yeah. Uh, then uh, Anne was looking to, uh, uh, local newspapers at MNHS and uh, found an account of, uh, of three boats getting stolen. They gave the uh, registration numbers of all of them, and this was this was a match. Yeah, I was going through the the microfilm and I went, oh, and I pulled up my laptop and there was the picture. So I mean, we matched the two. What we do then, because this is stolen property, we contacted the Hennepin County Sheriff's Water Patrol, gave them the story, told them what's up. The name of the guy who owned it was in the in the story, and so he, they contacted that man. You know, this was happened. This happened in 1977, and we we located this one night 2014, 2013. So it was still seven years ago that we found it, that we identified this one. Anyway, so he did to call the guy, and the guy, the guy, the sheriff, and the guy just said, "Yeah, it was stolen." Um, they took the mo they they obviously took the motor off, and he had eight hundred dollars worth of fishing equipment. So. If that's what they wanted, they took that off and sunk the boat because the boat was the least valuable. That's what we, we assume. Um, it, we don't think it, you know, we did, the police did say, you know, maybe an, a, an insurance thing, you know, because the guy did get insurance money. But it was a brand new boat. I can't imagine he just would have bought the boat. But anyway, so it's a stolen boat. There are other stolen boats we have information about on the lake, but haven't found any on the bottom for sure yet. So, oh, uh, I mean, this is just the story. This is another <laughs> uh, story, holy grail story for us. Uh, we found this boat, didn't have a license or registration number on it, uh, had the motor still attached, so we knew it wasn't sunk uh, on purpose. Uh, it was a Model R Alumacraft. We knew those are built between 1949 and 1959, so it gave us a 10-year area to do research in for, for the local newspapers. 
And uh, again, Ann found a, a newspaper account from 1952 of uh, two guys. Uh, one more, was a boy, really, yeah. 14, yeah. Yeah, the other was, what, 21? 27, 26, yeah. so he's a little older now. Yeah. Uh, an account where uh, their, their boat uh, got swamped by a quartering wave and uh, sank. The uh, younger boy drowned briefly and had to be resuscitated at the dock. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the newspaper article gave us the names of those guys, and uh, Anne was able to track down uh, one, the younger one, Tony McEwen. And I called it. Well, first of all, I, I mailed him uh, pictures of the of the wreck, and you know we found this on the bottom of the lake. And you know, is this the boat that you were in in this in this story? And then he called me, and he was, yeah, that was me. He was seventy eight years old. This is several years back. He's probably eighty three, eighty four now if he's still with us. And he told us the whole story, quartering wave, and the boat belonged to uh, this, a man named Richard, and he actually. Uh, just died in 2009. He was a pilot, and that explains the steering wheel. Yeah, that's, that's not aviation your, that's not, steering wheel. That's yeah. not your typical uh, boat steering wheel. And uh, he was a pilot. Wait, this was back in the 50s, and so was Tony's dad. And they actually got in their one of their planes and flew it around the, the lake where this went down and tried to see it. Well, it's 30 feet. You're not going to see to the mm -hmm. bottom. These are the lake water's not that clear, so they couldn't see it, of course. So when we you know located it. You know, so much, so many years later, and now it's an underwater archaeological site. Tony was thrilled, just thrilled. He couldn't, couldn't have been happier. And he sent me a, as a picture of him as a young boy when he was, when he was a, in junior high. So he was scary. He goes, all he remembers is he does remember hanging on, and then it's blank because he, he drowned literally. So, but anyway, he, he got better. <laughs> this is very unique in that it's made yeah. out of corrugated steel. Yeah, uh, neat. It also has the honor of being the first underwater archaeological site uh, listed in Ramsey County. Yeah, yay! Other sites exist, of course, but underwater, this is the first one. And just a fantastic little boat. I mean, and made out of corrugated metal. We were expecting, you know, a metal boat, just from the looks of it, probably not, you know, the sharp edges, probably not wood, whatever. And then we find corrugated metal. And to find them, you have to go to Australia. That picture, that old picture, that family in that corrugated metal boat, that's from Australia not from here. So they do some, um, some, some uh, smaller groups in, um, in population, smaller groups in Africa still use them or do use them to, the, to this day. It's very smaller versions, almost like canoes. But just the neatest thing on the, I just cannot say enough about how cool this wreck is. It was so fun to look at when we were diving on her. I hate so. to have seen what ran into it on its port oh, side there. Yeah, she's got a big chunk. Yeah. Um, we don't have sharks, so it can't be that. Um, the big donut. Tell us what this is, because we're not sure. Yeah. Um, it's a big donut. It, it rolled into the lake and stayed on its edge, literally. It's, it's a nine feet of water. It's very shallow, the, a very weird sonar signature. I thought it was going to be a sailboat. Yeah. Yeah, with that sonar, with that. And we did find uh, uh, an art, or advertisements for a, uh, this type of round boat, I guess you could purchase back. Yeah. Know, how many? How long? Well, this one's re recently. This, this okay. you still can get these. Yeah. Over the time, though, in the fifties and sixties, they had round aluminum boats that looked like red out of the Jetsons. Well, they yeah, weren't very popular, but like, they yeah, had them. They have like a, a a bar stool right in the center, uh, <laughs> and maybe a little motor, a trolling motor, a lot of times. Uh, and you just, spin around. And you just uh, motor around on your, I guess. The big selling point is that it's very transportable. You know, you come to the shore, you just tilt it on its, on its side and roll it. Roll it in. And whether this donut is one of those, we don't know. Like, and the centerpiece came out. We have no other explanation for why a big, big donut that's what, nine feet across? Ten, in yeah, nine, it's it's nine by nine-ish. It's a big donut. You can't swim through the hole, though. It's too, you're not with, a, not with tank on your back. Oh, crap, crap. The, the wreck itself isn't that amazing, except for the fact that Correct Craft didn't build aluminum boats. They built wood boats until they started, became ski nautique is what Correct Craft became. Except for in the early 1950s, they had a, a couple of Navy contracts during the Korean War to build small, uh, small uh, aluminum boats and some larger, almost landing craft type wooden uh, aluminum boats. Uh, that, but the one down here, obviously that's just a smaller personal boat. And so they weren't big on, it had to be wood, everything is wood, except this is a correct craft. It's design, it's a typical correct craft design mm -hmm. uh, in every way, except that uh, it's made out of aluminum. It, it, it's got a wood deck, of course. So it's a deck, a wood deck, aluminum body. We got the whole correct craft uh, pop, pop form. form, but 
you know, popular forum and people that are, are fans of CorrectCraft. And some of those guys worked at CorrectCraft in the 60s. So they, they got on board with this, and we were on this forum. And they said, that's an aqua skier. It, there's no doubt in their mind, early 50s aqua skier, and we have an aqua skier on the bottom of the lake. Um, that's wood, I mean, the way it's supposed to be. And they said, you're wrong, this is wood, we can see the seams. I said, no, you guys, that's faux. It's not real, that's it's faux lap straight, heart, sort of, faux yeah, clinkerish. I, yeah, I, and took, it, I took my dive night and scraped. Uh, on the inside, uh, yeah. No, uh, no. And it's- And you look inside, it's riveted. It, this is not a wooden boat. So the fact that it's done, it has correct craft stuff pads. It's, the, it's exactly a, an aqua skier from about 1952. It's got the right motor in it, um, mm. right, the right engine, it's an interceptor, Ford interceptor. Uh, so Gorge, one of my favorite wrecks right here is, is dug out. And if anyone knows who Doug is, we'd love to find out who Doug is because we don't know. And the hydroplane wreck. Again, not weird to find a hydroplane. Hydroplane sink. But look at the design of this yeah, thing. This is little... It's got fins. It's like a home build. It's, it's a home build, yeah, yeah. It's got these uh, weird fins at the stern, very narrow, and uh, obviously rigged for an outboard motor. Yeah, and this is 19 teens. I mean, this is a small outboard. This is the teens when this thing was built. And her, she had a canvas cover for her foredeck. She did not have wood, which is odd enough. In Minnesota, finding a canvas covered boat is very strange, sometimes it's canoes, but uh, not, not a race. This is a racing boat. It's one of the earliest racing boats that um, we've identified, and that's that's what makes it unique and weird. Um, it's in, in Lake Minnetonka. Why anyone probably sunk on purpose again to get rid of it. Who would sink this boat? It's the coolest looking thing, but they didn't want it anymore, so they sank her. Oh, the chair marina. Yeah. And okay, a, chair, a wreck is not that, you know, suspicious. It's a wreck, right? People, things sink, and this one obviously was in an accident. It's the backstory. Um, someone saw a, a, one of our talks we did in public or we were on TV a couple of times. They emailed me. Her name was Barb. Uh, I don't think that's her real name. Uh, she said from her Hotmail account and said, oh, I live next to the people that own that, that boat. And it happened on July 3rd, 1976 is during the bicentennial. And they were heading to Lord Fletcher's to go to dinner and a speedboat hit them and they, and they both sank. I said, okay, but it didn't happen in 19, it could have happened in 1976, but it didn't make the newspapers. So Bicentennial may have had something to do with it, but. But it didn't, make, something like this was very, everyone knew it was something that was going on and other wrecks on the Bicentennial made the papers. It could have happened 74, 75, 76, however, because the, this, the validation stickers uh, for registration numbers lasted for three years, still do. So it's just the backstory. We, we know it's, she said, the, oh, and the records with this one say that it's a Brunswick. Now, Brunswick did build boats, you know, but we're talking the bowling ball people, you know, the, the return bowling balls. Um, they did build boats, too. They actually bought Owens Yacht Company back in the 60s, and they bought Larson, our Minnesota Larson, for a few years before Larson actually got it back because they, they bankrupted it bankrupt of the company. And so they weren't so great at, at building boats in the 60s, but they, they have their hands in, in boats till this day, um, in larger boats. So, but this isn't a Brunswick. It's a Terra Marina. It's, it's obviously a Terra Marina. Uh, it, it's, and why is it amphibious? It's built from a surplus um, tra trailer that has wheels on it from... Yeah, basically, yeah. yeah, it was a marine contract. They built uh, these amphibious trailers that uh, you, can, you can basically uh, hook a, a towing hitch to the front and uh, uh, launch the boat. You can keep, you could, you have the option of taking the wheels off when it's in the water or keeping them on and just uh, motoring around. And uh, once you're through, you just hook the, put the hitch back on and tow it out. So it's, it's interesting and weird for a lot of reasons. And its motor is only a 35 horsepower. That big monster, it's huge, is only 35 horsepower. And it is from 1959. It's the Golden Jubilee of Evinrood Company. They had a big 50 Golden Jubilee. It's gold and it's pretty and shiny. And it's a Lark. It's a, a Lark version. Um, they came in black and white. And it was a special, uh, just for that year, look like that. So we all these neat, neat things and that poor boat that sank and just swished to pieces. It's a wonderful wreck to dive on because it's a, it's a true wreck in every sense of the word. Um, fiberglass hydroplane in Prior Lake. It's just interesting because it's an early hydroplane and it's early fiberglass. This is early 50s. And it's just, we don't find these things very often. And, but, and how she landed yeah. upright in the water column, pretty upright anyway. Yeah, scuttled. Um, scuttled, has rocks in her. Yeah. And really the reason she's in this, this discussion is basically because she's upright 
almost. Uh, she, we can see all the great uh, di different, uh, her wing, she's got wings, basically fins almost, that basically act for, to keep her from rolling over. She's just a bowl. But also the, and I've been finding in various and sundry um, boats, Rex we've been finding is that the, the bat, flat bottom where the chine is, it actually acts as a, a splash rail sometimes, keeps a splash off of people's faces. So just a neat wreck. And another one up in the water column, yeah. again, drag boat. Um, don't know why she sunk. Uh, probably, who knows, blew a boot, we don't know. So, hey, I had either a V6 or a V8 motor in it, so. Uh, yeah, I'm just. Yeah, it just overpowered itself. Yeah, don't know, and swamped. And we've got several of these coming that, um, I, the reason we have them in this discussion is they're up in the water column. Yeah, like, we had a lot of these. We have a bunch. More than we thought we'd find. <laughs> Ever. Um, and this one had a, a big motor, a big outboard. I mean, monster. And you can see the, the outdrive is sticking up out of the silt, and the power head is in the silt. And that's where the heavy bit is. So when it sank, the heavy bit hit first, and, and it's just you can swim around it. And it's a nice Alumacraft. Um, and these boats did have flotation foam, but that boat, for whatever it got, reason it got swamped, uh, don't know why. But then that motor was too heavy to even the, the the foam couldn't overcome it. Ah, and this one too, red fiberglass up in the water column, swimming around. Yeah. Um, the records for this from the state say that she is a Span America wreck. Now Span America is a company that uh, began in Ohio, in Iowa, moved to Minnesota, and then moved to uh, Wisconsin, then went out of business. It is not a Span America. It by no it's it, looks more like a Chrysler. Chrysler did build boats and it's a Chrysler Volvo Penta engine and, and the workings on the dash. Um, has its nice out drive there. But what's more, most interesting is the backstory. We found a duffel bag, a blue duffel bag sitting in the silt just when the boat hit the bottom. It fell out right there. It's sitting right there underneath the wreck. Yeah, so we took it on board. And we don't usually raise yeah, things. Don't, but uh, we thought if we found a, uh, any identification that might give us a clue as to its story and, and we figured it's personal and, property and so return it. but what we do in these cases though to to be uh up and up we contacted the office office of the state archaeologist these uh sheriffs uh Hennep hennepin county sheriff's water patrol and the dnr and we told all of them what we just did we found this duffel bag and we raised it we're telling all of you guys the wreck isn't old enough to be uh, a nautical archaeological site so it kind of falls under the dnr and you know we're going to try to we here's the guy that owned it we found his license plate or license plate his driver's Driver license. license and um the sheriff um at hennepin county he contacted the sheriff of the guy's town he lives in wisconsin now the guy then drove to spring park and got his duffel bag back after how you know nearly 30 years underwater and then he called me and told me what happened and it wasn't his boat it was his friend's boat he sunk his friend's speedboat and right. i just thought oh this poor guy, um, he lost a boot. The boot went, um, and the you know yeah, between the out drive and the out drive and the in the hull. Yeah, yeah, went, and this does have flotation foam because it's short enough. Because twenty two footers and over don't have to have flotation foam, um, but not enough flotation foam or whatever to overcome the rushing water, and it just sank in minutes. And so we gave him a duffel bag back. He went to his mom's in Richfield, just across the river here from our house in St. Paul. And he washed up his 1987 Twins World War, World, 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 World War II, yeah. the World Series shirt. Yeah. And he cleaned that up and he was wearing it. And he got his pair of Zuba pants, the Zuba uh, um, exercise pants, those awful things that were all baggy in the, night, in the 80s, the hammer pants, and a pair of New Balance tennis shoes and a pile of cigarettes and his really old wallet that had some change in a old dollar, some old dollar bills. So pulpy dollar bills. Pulpy right. dollar bills. So he got his stuff back, but he sunk his friend's boat and now he knows they know it's there. Another one in the water column. Yeah. That's what the theme is here. Uh, the glass bar. <clears throat> Again, heavy, heavy outboard motor. It's got the uh, Surflight or Star Flight 4. It's an Evan Rood. And this thing, they must have been water skiing. Same thing with the dugout that we showed you before. Yeah, landed uh, stern first, took in the water column. No. Uh, must have been enough flotation or air trapped in the bow to keep it up there. And what's good about this is um, the, the number for its registration does not show up in the state of Minnesota records because she sank before 1972. The records from 1959 to 1972 were destroyed during an office move when the Department of Conservation became the um, 
sorry, it was the conservation department became the Department of Natural Resources. Yeah. And when they made the move, they threw everything out. Yeah, another so. example of, you know, just because something may have happened recently doesn't mean it's still documented. So we have to always rebuild the story with what we find on board. So Glass Bar, obviously, Lucky Marine is a Hopkins, Minnesota company who sold the boat, but the key's still in the ignition. But a can of Budweiser, they, the, the can dates to 1968. I found a professor actually online who's, his hobby is, is cans, yeah. beer cans. Yeah, the can and was in the boat, hadn't been disturbed, hadn't dropped there. It was from it was from the wreck. And so we took a picture, he sent it, he goes, oh, that's 1968, and here's why, and he told us why. So this thing went down in 1968, or a beer can was a year old, and they went down in 1969, who knows. But another detail is you see in the, the hub of the steering wheel, the hands-free. That's a Curtis Wright hands-free steering design mechanism that yeah. Curtis Wright was... Curtis Wright, yeah. the same company that built P-40s in World War II, also uh, built uh, small boat steering wheels. And, and I, mean, I found one online that was new, new old stock, looks just like this. And we have, another, we have a boat, uh, dry boat that we've looked at and documented that has that too. So it's kind of neat. But again, up in the water column, there you go. And another one up in the water column. Is, this one's a huge, this is 26 footer up in the water column. It's a, our first Chris Craft in Lake Minnetonka. We got Chris Craft in Wiper Lake, but this is our first Chris Craft, and it's very young. It's very young. She's a 1986 uh, Stinger, and what's interesting about her is if you watch Miami Vice, Crockett and Tubbs drove around in a 39-foot Stinger, same same design, just bigger boat. And she, when she sunk, she's 26 feet. She went down six feet under the silt. That's how long she, and just sticking straight up in 72 feet of water. Her bow, however is around 50 feet. <laughs> so she's, and she still has her cover. Still has the cover. Uh, if you look through the uh, windscreen, you can see uh, uh, seats still floating inside there, seat cushions. And we, what we think is she's got, she's tied off at her, at her um, towing cleat there. We think she was being towed and for some reason started sinking and they cut the tow line. The tow line has a nice cut on it or it came off a dock. That always could be the case, of course, but if she came off the dock, why'd she sink? Had to be a really big storm. But she has her cover, so that means she wasn't either. She wasn't being driven around. And she's. This was a. This is a forty-five thousand dollar boat when she was bought new, and she sunk by nineteen ninety. So in that four-year period, they lost themselves a very expensive boat. And standing straight up in the water column, so one of the, it's fascinating. She's not going anywhere. She's so wedged in there, six feet of her underneath. And another one in the water column. Yeah, of this one's also standing on end. We. Don't have any underwater pictures over yet. But. Yeah, we have, we took some video. Uh, we dove on a couple of times, but we haven't processed those pictures the right way. But just to show, look at our different ways. It's the coolest wreck. She's a Larson All American Runabout 165. The reason we know she's a 165, she's got the the drive, the Curtis Wright drive on her. Uh, so, in Larson, we we documented that red and white Larson uh, from the Minnesota Historical Society just recently. We're working on a report for that right now. We 3D scanned her. Um, as a boat, one of the boats in their collection. And it has hands-free uh, Curtis Wright as well. Yeah. But this wreck has the blue stripe. So Same as the one in the upper photo. Yeah, so, so that's the boat you're gonna see if you, if you go scuba dive on her, full of zebra mussels, but we cleaned off enough to see the stripe. The innards are just like the one we've already documented. We're very, very familiar with what the Larson 165 looks like. And there you go. Um, her her license not her uh, registration number i got the information back yesterday from the dnr about um what her registration we weren't sure if it's 3557 or 3567 and it's neither of those because that's listed as a core craft from bemidji so we don't have the right number yet we have to dive again and make try to get that number to make out the, the numbers are, are worrying off worrying off. and we're near the end hey. <laughs> personally if you don't dive please um go to it when you see a dive flag respect it 150 feet around all of them. If we have four dive flags, it's 100 feet around all four of them. Uh, we currently have this one, we have that one, and we have another kind. We've got a flag on the boat, it's four feet long. People still don't see it. And a big sign that I hold up, you know, don't run us over, you can kill us with your propeller. That's our website, um, the cartoon by us. I'm gonna turn, um, turn this off so I can get the couple folks that joined late, if I can get you guys, um, you can, as if you wanna ask questions, you can come in as, um, as uh, attendee, as um, panelists, if you want to talk, 
I'm promoting you guys to panelists. Oh, it's Tom. Hi, Tom. Uh, and Tom, I know you can't, you, you can only type, right? But so if you want to type something, we've got the chat up here. Um, yeah, Tom got here, but late. Yep. So um, if you guys have any questions, please do ask them. Um, if you want to be a, um, let me see all the pan panelists here. Yeah, Steve, if you want to, um, I'm going to give you, to do make you a panelist. Um, if you want to unmute, you can and you can talk if you want to, if not. Um, but we've got, um, Kevin can talk. Do you have any questions, Kevin? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you for a wonderful presentation. It's really gives you an excellent idea of uh, what's down there and what the you weird can do stuff. with the <laughs> group. And it, it was a terrific uh, presentation. <clears throat> I'm wondering, what's the smallest size of an object you can detect with the side scan sonar? Obviously, you're dealing with some really small things. But I assume the scanner has sort of a limitation on what it could pick up. But I, I don't have any sense of, of what, when you're yeah. just going on the boat, what you can right. find. I think right. the smallest boat we ever found was like six feet. That's wreck. A wreck. But, but, but yeah. small thing, yeah. But, yeah, and we found rocks that have been smaller than that. See, this, with the, the sonar we're using right now is much better than the one we used to have. But of course, there's better ones out there. Ours is three years old. If we go through, and it, the biggest thing with the, the, the sonar is weeds if weeds are in the way, and water depth. So if we're going, say, over a, a rock garden that's only nine feet deep or something, you can see every individual rock. I mean, you can almost see pebbles. It's really, really detailed. Um, you know, the moraines that were left from the glaciers, we can see the moraines very, very clearly, obviously, because our, if our sonar's got 100 foot on this side, 100 foot this side, and we go through, you can see the moraine lines. But if you go, if you make the, the, the length of beam is, a, is also another reason, because once you make the beam longer, things become smaller. And so your deeper water, longer beam, things are smaller. So you shorten the beam up, but another problem with that is when you shorten the beam up, the down image gets bigger. So, and you'll, so you'll get stuff in the down image and you can still read it. So you've got down, down and side, so you get, you get both of those. But as far as actual thing, um, what is the smallest, I mean, the smallest actual thing? Um, we don't dive on things that are really tiny because they're probably we think they're probably rocks. So yeah. it, it's a hard question to answer because we've dove on like a, well, yeah, a wreck that's six there's, feet there's long. There's one rock yeah. we dove on that we want to go back to because we were wondering if it might actually be a meteorite. Yeah, yeah. that was only five feet, five feet long. Yeah, so five it, it feet was, long. Yeah. But when we're, we're looking at uh, barrels, barrels are three feet. Now, we get barrels in the lake. Some people drop barrels in lakes, of oh, course. The buckets that were... Buckets? But did they look like buckets? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. The the submerged water ski course um, had bucket anchors with it, and we could see those buckets. Those they're Menards buckets, the five gallon buckets. We could see those as a round. But what I notice a lot, because I do all the sonar review, um, is um, the barrels we find. You know, fifty five gallon drums all over the place, including half ones, half barrels. Those, um, if the water's shallow enough, you can see the rings around them, and then you we have a you can take the cursor and you can click on uh, a tool and you can measure the, the, the size of it. And they're about three, three and a half feet. So then you go, okay, that's a barrel. We can get the detail of the rings of the barrel. So I'd say three and a half feet and usually it's a barrel would be my smallest thing. I could, oh, that's a barrel for sure kind of thing. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, can, can you detect things once they're sunk into the mud? I mean, under the mud or is that too, you're not gonna pick that up on a sonar? A little bit. Um, but as you need a sub bottom profiler for that. We can pick a little bit, on, like, just this much. A couple of the wrecks that we've gotten, are, we've, we've actually found, we're surprised we found them because they're mostly buried, but they're buried very shallowly. shallowly. And, very and shallow. um, it turns out to be a boat, a wreck. So just a little, but um, you need a, a bo sub bottom profiler for that. We do have a question from Steve Workman. Hi guys, Robert Wheeler of MHS. Yep, did a lot of work in the Boundary Waters area in the 50s and 60s. Have you done any research of fur trading colonial history sites in the past few years it's by Steve Workman? Hi Steve. We haven't, no. no. As far as anyone else has, no. Um, we have voices we from the rapids. Here, I've got the book here. This is uh, MHM Central here, my, my desk. Um, ah, it's stuck because my desk is full of crap. Okay. 
Here we this go. This is kind of considered the Bible. This is the book. For that sort of work. Voices from the Rapids by Wheeler et al. Um, it's probably backwards. Well, yeah, I, I <laughs> probably, it's probably backwards to you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know if I don't, anybody, we're the only two underwater archaeologists working in Minnesota, and we are not doing the work. So um, sometimes the, the Duluth folks hire yeah, divers. Duluth Conservation Center, they'll hire divers if they've got something to do in Duluth. Um, we've actually tried to get jobs up there, and we've been, we haven't been hired, which is kind of a bummer. But they'll hire non-archaeologist divers, which we're not really thrilled about. Um, but there's nothing we, we you know, have no power over that decision. So as far as I know, there is no work going up at the Quidico Superior area at this, at has, or has been since this, that project ended in 1973 and the book came out in 75. So, so Dave Vesser, how about some of the work you have done on the steamboats in the Mississippi and Aiken County? Uh, we'll be talking about that on our, in two weeks, we've got another, uh, uh, one of these with large wooden boats. We'll be talking about those wrecks, but we can certainly answer the question now. Um, we haven't been back to Aiken for a few years. Yeah. Um, the main wreck we've been looking at is yeah. the uh, Andy Gibson, uh, which uh, was built in 1894 and uh, no, 1884 and uh, abandoned in 1892. And she was on a cradle, which is interesting. Um, there, that would, you know what, that would have been something we should have done for the weirdness. Maybe. It's a weird yeah. one because it actually, there's a cradle but, built underneath her. Yeah. Shoot. And, and as yeah. the boat decayed, it collapsed around the cradle, around the pilings, and that actually, I think, helped keep her in place. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. She was, she's a, she's what was, is a weird one. We'll put her in the wood, the large wooden boat presentation, and you can watch that. Um, the Red Mill wreck, we think, is a Wanigan, um, and that wreck, we are not, we're not sure it's a Wanigan, but we're pretty sure she is. It's supposed to be in the area that uh, this one other boat, mm -hmm. whose name escapes me. The well, there's the Swan, and then there's um, the, the other one. one. Yeah. Other one. Oh, gosh. You get, we haven't worked on it in a few years. Um, so there's another wreck, we think, nearby. That means there's four wrecks in a two-mile uh, stretch at Aiken. Um, we also identified a... Um, a, a lumber mill site in Aitken, and we got that an archaeological site number. And north of Aitken, it's still in the county, though. We we got um, landings. We've got a uh, mill area up uh, near Palisade has got the uh, Mississippi Landing. It's called where they've had lots of uh, uh, different piers for the trains to bring stuff and the boats to pick up stuff and the the boats to take yep. stuff away and. Um, so those are all in our reports. But the one thing I really liked about the Andy Gibson is that when we, uh, is that as it decayed, uh, the riverbank collapsed onto its starboard side and actually uh, helped preserve it up to the main deck level. Yep. Uh, we don't normally find that uh, in uh, Mississippi riverboat wrecks or any, any riverboat wrecks really. The, uh, usually uh, the currents and the Corps of Engineers usually do their work and uh, but if you have anything, it's just the bottom planking and some frames. Yeah, she's uh, probably but, the best preserved in this Mississippi. But this one actually yeah. had up to the main deck level and still had some deck planking in place and, and deck beams. And what's, what it happened, then the deck collapsed and, and sandwiched, but was still intact, just folded down. And so when we, were, we actually dug into the, um, shore, into the, the, the shore and we're doing terrestrial archaeology technically because it was dry archaeology at that point until we hit the water table, water table. Water table. Oh, I'm sorry. My phone's ringing. I should. I was going to turn that off. Sorry, guys. I'll, uh, and it's not even anyone I know. Um, so uh, then, with that, since so we had the deck and we had, um, it's the most complete um, Mississippi River steamboat that's ever been found. Really, as well, far as that's concerned, the deck level, not the most complete everywhere else. But yeah. uh, we can see exactly how she's built. Her cocked hats and all that stuff are there. So. Um, we haven't been back working up there lately because we've done so many surveys around our suburban lake stuff um, in, around Lake Minnetonka and then, of course, all the smaller lakes, Prior Lake, Christmas Lake we just dove on That's kind of, earlier this summer and 13 wrecks and little itty bitty Christmas. Yeah, we also like to try to catch it when the water's at an extreme low level. And it's been hard because the, the, we can't predict the weather these days at all. And so we have to catch it when the water's low and um, we can... Otherwise, the current's too strong, and we don't want to destroy bits and pieces. What we will do when the water is a little higher on Andy Gibson, we'll bring our, our volunteer divers up, and we'll literally, they'll travel down with the, with the current and just video as they go, and we'll grab them at the other end um, with some lines. So, well, fortunately, the current yeah. isn't very ripping at that area. No, so. 
but it's just we can't see a whole lot because um, it is a river. So when the water's low, it's great. The, the, the wreck comes out of the water and we can just document and document. So we're almost done actually the, 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 the tape to the wall over here by our treadmill uh, is the, the site plan for, for her yeah, sure. and what we've got online too. So um, I think one more day's yeah. solid day's work on there. I can probably fill it in. Yeah, we got so next year, hopefully maybe we'll get back to it, but we, we need to, to plan that. So, okay, any other questions? Just one, how long have you been doing this? It sounds like you have a tremendous amount of experience with this. We're, you're calling us old. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. <laughs> well, you um, mentioned seven years at one point. So oh, I, that's I just step, yeah, MHM has, was founded 16 years ago. Um, but we've both been uh, doing, doing archaeology for 30 years. Um, yeah, I start, 1989 was my first archaeological project. And you were? I was at uh, Port Royal, Jamaica in 87. Okay. So you've been, that was in college for you. Yeah. Um, so we've been doing underwater archaeology since, I, my first arch, underwater archaeological project was in 1992 with Cornell University. Um, I learned to scuba dive at the U of M, because I, I went to the U of M, I got my bachelor's degree from the U of M. And uh, out of my, I needed to have a, um, a FIED credit, of course, so I took scuba diving with the intention of doing underwater archaeology. So that worked out really well. Um, so yeah, the terrestrial archaeology, my first under what, my first archaeology was 1989 with the U of M at the research center up at uh, Itasca. I, for a summer, we, we did some excavations there. But at under, underwater archaeology, the first actual was, was, yeah, for me, was in Greece, doing a, a sunken city at, this, at the site of Halai in Greece. And I do, dove in the Saronic Gulf a little bit with the Greek Archaeological Service. And you, Jamaica, and well, then... Jamaica, Port Royal. Yeah. And uh, then I did terrestrial archaeology uh, yeah. with the Institute for Minnesota Archaeology for about four years and went to uh, East Carolina University. And, and that's did, where we met. Did, did as many uh, <laughs> field work, as much field work as I could do there. So then when we got out of grad school and then I still was working on my PhD at the time, I, I have since, of course, finished my PhD. But um, we founded MHM in 1986. Uh, we had been working um, actual jobs, jobs with uh, the Steamboat Minnehaha with the Minnesota Transportation Museum from, uh, for him, what, 1999 and me 2000 until 2003. Then the museum kind of imploded, exploded, um, and we, the Minnehaha went off on its own and we helped set that up, but they couldn't hire us because there's no money. So we ended up not working for Minnehaha anymore. And then, um, in night, so we founded MHM. And we started getting at good work done. We started doing bits and pieces for a few years, but by 19 or by 2010, um, the legacy amendment was put put in place in Minnesota by a vote of the the, the people of Minnesota, and that's where our grants are coming from. Uh, we've gotten several grants, uh, well over 30 actually. From uh, we just found out we got another one um, from the legacy amendment grants, the Minnesota Historical and Cultural Heritage grants. So. We were the only two people that do underwater archaeology, so um, MHM is 16 years old this year. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. No problem. Anyone else there? How about, oh, okay, then anything else? Okay, no? Everyone else has left. No, we're still here. Tom left. Tom, oh, bye, Tom. He, well, we know Tom. So thanks, guys. Um, we've got another presentation a week from tonight and another one after that. You're welcome to join us. Um, I, the mouse doesn't work so great on these presentations. So when I can get to you guys and, and bring you up as, as um, uh, panelists, I will, because you can talk, I'd love to have you talk with us. I'm in Wisconsin, Kevin, okay. Yeah, Keith Meverden. I don't know, I don't is know. he? We don't, we don't do anything with Wisconsin. Um, there is a, there's a, another person that worked with Keith and she might be the state under, they, they work through the Historical Society of Wisconsin. Um, so as far as, we don't know because we don't work in yeah. Wisconsin at all because so, we're Minnesota. So yeah, um, kept in touch they, they've actually, Keith a couple of times has been overseeing um, amateur uh, projects from the, well, very talented uh, uh, Great Lakes Shipwreck Preservation Society, um, especially the Mayflower, a scow schooner up there. He was like the you know, archeologist in residence there, um, even though it's Duluth. And actually, we technically, I think we might be, do that sometime for them, you know, help you know, be like, you know, overseers or something. But honestly, we don't know what's going on in Wisconsin if uh, no one tells us because <laughs> we're doing what we're doing. So I, we don't have a good, good answer for that. I don't know. We should keep up more. But I don't know if there's anything going on. I, it's at Lake Superior, if anything, that affects Minnesota. It would be Lake Superior. I don't know of any 
inland work is going on in the, in the river, lakes and rivers of Wisconsin because the only reason there's work going on lakes and rivers in Minnesota is because MHM is doing it. Um, you know, we don't have a state underwater archaeologist in Wisconsin, in Minnesota. We're, we've become the de facto state underwater archaeologist, although we don't work for the state, you know, private nonprofits. So, um, you know, we're the only ones doing this kind of work, I think, around here. So that didn't really help you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Um, anything else? Anyone typing? Doesn't look like it. Ufta. Ufta. <laughs> yeah. Ufta. Um, that's Norwegian, right? I'm not Norwegian. That's Scandinavian. Um, it's Scandinavian. Well, I'm Swedish. Part Swedish. So, bye. Um, okay. Uh, Dave left. And so, thanks, Steve. Um, thanks for coming. Got two more of these, like I said, a week, a week from today and a week after that. So, we're ready to go. Bye. <laughs>